We shall now turn to this uh, psalm which we read together, um, Psalm 130, and we'll consider the, the psalm together tonight. It's a wonderful gospel psalm. It speaks to us, yes, it tells us about sin, but it tells us too about forgiveness, about plenteous redemption, which is to be found in him. As a psalm, it can be applied to Christ, to the Messiah. Out of the depths he cried. You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, the depths that he was in, how he cried there, Abba, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He was in the depths there. You remember how he was in the depths on the cross when he cried out, I thirst. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Christ was there in the very depths of hell. And with strong crying and tears, he prayed unto him that was able to deliver him. And he was heard in that he feared. So we can apply it to Christ the Messiah. As all the Psalms are messianic and we can apply them to Christ. But I would like to take tonight as descriptive of the personal experience of the Lord's people. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. We were all in the depths, weren't we, before we were converted? In the depths of our sin, in the depths of our lostness. We sang together in Psalm 40 about the fearful pit and the miry clay. Well, that's the way we were at one time. We were down in the depths of the fearful pit and the miry clay. But by the grace of God, we cried out, cried for deliverance. And the Lord heard us and saved us. He took me from the fearful pit and from the miry clay and set our feet upon a rock, establishing our way. He put a new song in our mouths, our God to magnify. Many shall see it and shall fear and on the Lord rely. We thank God for taking us from the pit and setting our feet firmly upon Jesus Christ the rock and putting a new song of joy into our hearts. But here I would take it that the psalmist is talking about the experience of the Christian. And as Christians, we sometimes enter the depths. Sometimes because of our sin, a darkness comes over us. Because of our backslidings, the Lord withdraws from us for a while. We feel a coldness, a deadness, a lostness. God seems far away from us. Sometimes we're very conscious of a, a depression coming over us, a miserable sense of our own sin and guilt and lostness. It's so easy for us to sin against God. Sin is so natural. And sometimes we sin in a very obvious, a very obvious way. How could we? How could we sin against this loving Father? How could we sin against the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us on the cross? But we do. We let him down with hypocritical we're proud, we're envious, we're bad-tempered, we're lustful, we've got our idols, and we find ourselves in the, in the pit, a sense of lostness, and in these dark places, feeling God is far away from us. We're miserable, we're sad, we're ashamed. 
the pit. Do you know what it is to be in the pit? Do you know what it is tonight to be in a pit? Do you know depression in your experience and darkness and a sense of lostness? Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Well, we see here that the answer is in prayer. Always pray. We ought always to pray and not to faint, Christ tells us. God's angry with us. The devil says to us, because God's angry, you shouldn't really pray. You can't pray. You dare not pray. Are you not ashamed to pray? How can you draw near to God when you've just been wallowing in sin? But the sooner we come back to God, the better. It's the devil that tries to keep us away. That's why Paul says, pray without ceasing. In another place, be instant in prayer. Constantly pray. Remember Jonah. God told Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach against its wickedness. But he decided he didn't want to do that. So he set off in the opposite direction. He was going to go to Tarshish in Spain. He went down to Joppa, got into a boat and fell asleep. Off they went to Tarshish. But they hadn't gone too far when the Lord sent a storm. And the storm was so bad that the only escape was to throw Jonah overboard. And there he was swallowed by a fish that God had prepared to do that. It took a long time for Jonah to pray. But then at last, in the belly of the fish, he cried out. He prayed to the Lord. And as he puts it himself, out of the belly of hell, cried I. And the Lord heard me. It's amazing where you can be and the Lord will hear you. The belly of a fish, the dungeon of a prison, far away from a church, you cry out to the Lord, and the Lord hears. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O God. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Our duty, when we find ourselves in the pit, because of our sin is to confess our sin the sooner the better confess it to God admit it and there's a promise if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so the answer to the pit is prayer then third verse, the third verse, If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquity, O Lord, who shall stand? If God marks our sin against us, there's no hope. We're such sinners. We sin every day. We sin in every way. We sin so much. One sin deserves hell. What does a million sins deserve? If thou shouldest mark iniquity, if God was to mark our iniquity against us, we're finished. But then that's the gospel, isn't it? That God marks our sin against Christ. That's the wonder of it. Our sins marked, not against us, but against Christ. Our sins laid on him. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He took our sins to Calvary and suffered there for them. Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. He made himself an offering for sin. He was made sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We sin, we sin daily. God hates sin. God must punish sin. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth it shall die. How can we escape? 
only by Christ taking our place, takes our sin and takes our punishment. He marks our sin against Christ. There's none righteous, no, not one. Christ is righteous. His righteousness becomes mine when I believe in him. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Zechariah chapter 3, we're told about Joshua the high priest standing before God and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him and Joshua clothed in filthy garments. The high priest about to perform the work of a high priest and his garments full of dung, stinking filthy. And Satan's there saying, how can you be a priest? How can you stand before God? How can you do the work of God? You're a disgrace. And then God says, or the intercessor, the Lord Jesus Christ says, take off him the filthy garments, put on him new clean clothes. The Lord rebuke thee, Satan. The Lord that hath saved Jerusalem rebuke thee. The filthy garments are taken off and he's clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And so Joshua is acceptable with God and Satan has to go away disgraced. That's the, the gospel for us. The wonder of the gospel. Our filthy clothes taken off and Christ's beautiful spotless white robe covers us. And so we can stand in God's presence, accepted by God. The amazing mercy of God. If, Lord, thou shouldest mark iniquities, who could stand? Not one of us. Verse 4. With thee there is forgiveness that thou mayest be feared. That's a wonderful truth. God forgives us. Why? That thou mayest be feared. What kind of fear? It's not the fear of punishment. It's not a slavish fear. But it's the fear of a son to a father. It's a loving fear, a reverential fear. It's a relationship of respect to God and involvement with God. Not running away from him, but running to him as the great God. We fear, we honor, we adore, we worship, we love. We, we, we're so thankful to be close to, to this great God. And with thee is forgiveness, so that thou wilt have a people, so that thou wilt have sons and daughters. With thee there is forgiveness, so that Christ will have a bride. And the bride of Christ is his people. Christianity, as we often say, is a relationship. With thee there is forgiveness, so that we enter a relationship with God. God wants us to love him and it's wonderful when we realize that he loves us and we love him because he first loved us. Are you one of God's children? Do you love him? Are you in a relationship with him? With thee there is forgiveness that thou mayest be feared. Then verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I hope. We pray and we wait. We pray and we look for an answer. We pray and we trust in God. We pray waiting. Waiting for assurance waiting for comfort, waiting for deliverance from the pit, waiting for 
the joy of the Lord to fill our hearts. Sometimes we pray and it seems God's not answering us. Why, Lord? I prayed yesterday and the day before and the day before that and the day before that and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and there's no answer. Why, Lord? Sometimes we have to wait, but it's good to wait upon the Lord. God will answer us in the appropriate time. He has made promises. He says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock, knock at the door of heaven and it shall be opened to you. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. There's so many encouragements to pray. This poor man cried, God heard and saved him from all his distresses. The publican in the temple, God be merciful to me a sinner. God heard him and he went to his house justified, forgiven, pardoned, accepted. So we are to, to wait upon the Lord. And you remember the great promise in Isaiah, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's always worth praying. Never a waste of time Pray. Pray and don't give up. Pray and wait. Wait on God, looking to the Lord, trusting in God, waiting in faith. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and my hope is in his word, in his promises, what he said he would do. <clears throat> and then verse 6, my soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Sometimes the night seems very long. The watchman, and it's dark, and he's longing for the dawn to break. Maybe you're sick, nauseous, lying on your bed. You're turning this way, turning that way. When will the morning come? When will the darkness give way and the dawn appear? Sometimes it's like that with God's people. We wait for the morning. More, more than they that wait for the morning, we wait for God. In the long hours of darkness, sometimes it's God's will to put us through these experiences of darkness because it's in times of darkness often that we grow spiritually. As Rutherford said, grace flourishes in the winter, unlike other plants, as it were, which don't grow in the winter. Grace grows in winter. When we're going through these winter experiences, cold and hard and difficult, and, and yet these are purifying for the soul, enriching for us spiritually. Weeping may for a night endure. Joy comes in the morning. The dawn will come. And joy comes in the morning. And then verse 7. Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy. And with him is plenteous redemption. How wonderful. Plenteous redemption. God's not miserly. He's not grudging in the way that he deals with us. He's rich in mercy unto all that call upon him. He's plenteous, bountiful. He blesses us with so many blessings. He loves to save. He delights in showing mercy. He glorifies himself 
in his kindness and generosity to us. He's long-suffering and slow to wrath, in mercy plenteous. He delights to pardon, though your sins be as scarlet, calling out for vengeance, though they be red like crimson, demanding punishment. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool, white like wool. God washing away our sins. I am he that blotteth out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Pardon, wiped clean, washed away. I am he that heals your backslidings. I will heal your backslidings. I will love you freely. I will be as the Jew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. God heals our backslidings. However much we have backslidden, however much we've fallen, however deep the pit into which we have gone, there's deliverance. Look up, trust, cry, wait upon the Lord. And the deliverance will come. God is love. And God loves to save. <coughs> he is plenteous in redemption. Let Israel hope in the Lord. Hope in Jehovah. Hope in the Lord God Almighty. Trust in the Lord. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. With the Lord there is mercy. And with him is plenteous redemption. And then verse 8. <clears throat> and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Whatever iniquities, whatever sins. Redemption. That's the promise. Whatever we have done wrong. Do thou with hyssop sprinkle me, I shall be cleansed and so. Yea, wash thou me, and then I shall be whiter than the snow. Remember David. David sinned terribly. He did things which I would hope none of us would do. He committed adultery. And then to cover up his adultery, he murdered the woman's husband. Terribly wicked. Surely there's no pardon for such a, a wicked man. And yet, the Lord forgave him. The Lord pardoned him. You know, if we confess our sin, if we repent of our sin, if we are sorry and grieve for our sins and return to the Lord and <coughs> pour out our heart to him, the Lord loves to forgive. Whatever you've done. If the Lord were to hold the sins of the very best of us against us, we'd be condemned. And the Lord will not hold the sins of the very worst of us against us. If we trust in Christ. If we repent and believe the gospel. I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions. Think of the woman who came to Jesus in Luke chapter 7. She was a notorious sinner. We're not told what she does, what she did. We can't imagine. But she was a terrible sinner. And Simon the Pharisee was looking and thinking, why does Jesus let that woman anywhere near him? If he were a prophet, he would know the sort of things she did. He wouldn't have anything to do with her. But it's wonderful that Jesus has something to do with her. And that Jesus does know what this woman has been doing. There she is at his feet. As he lies reclining, eating food. She's at his feet and she's pouring down her tears, weeping. And as she weeps, her tears fall on his dusty feet. And then she takes her hair and wipes her, his feet. Simon the Pharisee invited him to a meal, but it was a very cold kind of meal. 
didn't provide any water for washing his feet, didn't wash his feet. But here's this woman, and she washes Jesus' feet with her tears and wipes them with the hair of her head. Would you do that? You wash Jesus' feet with your tears, wipe them with the hair of her head. And Jesus said to her, Go in peace. Thy sins are forgiven thee. He who is forgiven much loves much. Have you been forgiven much? Do you think of yourself as somebody who's been forgiven much? If you have been, you love Christ much. But if you haven't been forgiven very much, well, it's not surprising that you don't love them much. The more we see our own personal sin, the more amazed we are that Christ forgave, forgave us. And the more we love him who first loved us and love him who gave himself for us. And he shall redeem Israel from all iniquities. He pays the ransom price. You are redeemed not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we have here then a psalm which describes for us Christian experience, common Christian experience. You and I know what it is from time to time to be in the pits, as it were, to be in a place of darkness, in a place of sadness, because of our sin. But there's plenteous redemption. The Lord hears our cry. The Lord delivers us, pardons us, washes us, sets us on our way again. Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and in him is plenteous redemption. Let's pray.